Good morning, everyone. And welcome once more, uh, despite the inclement weather. Uh, good to see you. And uh, our service has been conducted by the Reverend Jim Winter, who will also uh, be taking our service, God willing, uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, whether or not uh, we, uh, an actual church, a physical church meeting takes place in December is a moot point at the moment, but uh, we always ask for anybody who has any item that they would have liked to have raised uh, to, to let Graham have that beforehand. So if there were any items that you were going to raise, it, it, assuming there was a meeting, um, would you please let him have it by a fortnight today? Thank you very much. Very warm welcome to our morning service. May God be glorified as we worship him together on this Lord's day. The psalmist says, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Our opening hymn is Great God of Wonders, All Thy Ways Are Matchless, Godlike and Divine. And as uh, usual, uh, Margaret will play through the tune and then we'll stand and we we'll say this hymn together. <laughs> All thy ways are matchless, godlike, and divine. But to the fair glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled shine. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich, so free? Such dire offences to forgive, such guilty daring souls to spare. This is thy grand prerogative and none shall in the honour share. Who is a pardoning God like thee, or who has grace so rich, so free? In wonder lost, with trembling joy, we take the pardon of our God, pardon for sins of deepest dye, a pardon sealed with Jesus' blood. Who is a pardoning God like thee, or who has grace so rich, so free? O oh, may this glorious, matchless love, this godlike miracle of grace, teach mortal tongues like those above to raise this song of lofty praise. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich, so free? Shall we continue in our worship as we draw near to God in prayer? Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here this morning to worship you. Who is a pardoning God like thee? And who has grace so rich and free? And so, dear Lord, as we come into your presence, we seek your pardon. Pardon for sins of deepest dye, as we've read. Pardon for all those thoughts that flash in and out of our minds and the ones that we harbour that we know are not pleasing to you. Pardon for those times when temptation comes and we do not resist, we yield. Pardon, dear Lord, that's so free and full because of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, and because of the sacrifice that he made on Calvary's cross. And so, Lord, we claim that promise in your word. For if we confess our sin, you are faithful, just, to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray you will do that now, dear Lord as we bring our burdened sins to you, that we might worship you freely, that we may be able to boldly come to the throne of grace this morning, cleansed with the precious blood of Jesus, clothed in the robe 
of his righteousness. For there is no other name given among heaven whereby we must be saved but Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. And so we thank you for this access that we have to you. And we pray, dear Lord, that as we come into your presence, we may do so with thankful hearts for every blessing that you've bestowed upon us, even during this past week, for the health and strength to be in this very building, for the ability that we have to open the Bible and read your word, and this wonderful, wonderful access we have to you in prayer through our great high priest, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer, the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin, who draws men and women out of this world into your kingdom through the cross of Christ. We thank you, dear Lord, that he is here and he will enable us to worship your life. Be conscious too, dear Lord, that whenever we gather, whenever our intent is to glorify you, our minds begin to wander. And we know that these are the fiery darts of the evil one, seeking to distract us. May they be quenched by the shield of faith this morning as we come into your presence to worship you. And we thank you, dear Lord, we're not alone in this. So throughout the world, your people are praising you. When the sun rose this morning, there were men and women in prayer. And when it sets this evening, not only will there be your people in prayer, there will be new brothers and sisters in Christ because the gospel has been proclaimed faithfully and your spirit has done his work. And Christ has been lifted up. And men and women and boys and girls that have repented and believed this gospel for the very first time. Oh, how we praise you for this matchless miracle of love. And we come into your presence and we ask that we might glorify your life because we come to you in the precious and wonderful name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our uh, Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the prophet Isaiah and the 49th chapter. You have it uh, printed out in front of you, those of you in the building. And it's uh, concerning the servant of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 49. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished, polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have laboured in vain. I spent my energy and my strength on nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. Now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved birth of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favour I have answered you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritage. Saying to those prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. All the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land Siam. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, 
for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather, they come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament and you shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants. And those who have swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms. And your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant be rescued for... I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Saviour and Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. We're going to stand and recite our second hymn. Margaret's going to play through the tune for us. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When weary in this earthly race, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every wild and stormy gale, my anchor holds will not fail. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. His vow, his covenant and blood are my defence against the flood. When earthly hopes are swept away, he will uphold me on that day. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When the last trumpet voice shall sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Our New Testament reading is much shorter than our Old Testament reading, and it's taken from the Gospel of John and the fourth chapter and verses 46 to 54. So he, that
that is Jesus, came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my son dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Shall we come to God in prayer? Mighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we will not return to you empty, but will accomplish your purpose. And so we thank you that your word is going forth across this world today. Wherever your people may meet, all those services and events taking place on the internet and on the radio and television, there will be people listening to your word, some for the very first time. Some, Lord, who have heard it many times and yet have failed to respond to it. But we know, dear Lord, that when your word is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit will work, will <coughs> move. Like a, like a wind that blows. And may that wind just waft across this world today into the minds, into the hearts, into the lives of others, opening them up to see the truth within the Bible, unstopping their ears that they may hear your voice speaking to them and responding and giving <coughs> themselves completely into your hands for their salvation their eternal destiny. And so we pray your blessing upon your word in whatever form it is being used, <coughs> whether it's verbally or in a written form. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your church in the world. And we know that there are many who can still not gather together to, to sing your praises or to worship you. But there will be twos and threes, and there will be more, Lord, coming together to Praise your holy name. Bless each church, each fellowship. Bless pastors and teachers. Bless those who serve you faithfully. Think of missionaries that we know who are now labouring in very different and difficult circumstances. Bless them, Lord, and use them for your glory. We pray for those who are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. We know, dear Lord, the wrath of evil is coming down in, with a heavy hand upon your church throughout this world. Oh, how we pray that they may be strong in the power of the Lord. They may have the whole armour of God upon them as they face this evening. Deliver them, we pray, Lord, and use them for your glory. Strengthen and encourage each one of them. We pray for the nations of the world, particularly at this dire time in the history of this planet, for those who are grappling with this disease, those who have fallen foul of it, those who are struggling with their health, struggling with so many other difficulties, employment, and businesses, and everything else that has ravaged this planet. We pray for those who are seeking to find a vaccine, those who are seeking to find a way out of this. And so, Lord, we pray for those in authority. Oh, Lord, give them great wisdom. For, Lord, they are stumbling around in the dark, so to speak, never having faced anything like this before. Bless them, Lord. Pray for our Prime Minister and Government and Parliament and those who rule and reign over us. Your hand will be upon them. And Lord, we pray that what is happening in this world will give food for thought, 
about man's strength, man's infallibility. But people may realize the fragility of human life. There are things that happen we can do nothing about. We are helpless. And yet, dear Lord, there is a God who created this world, who sent his son to redeem those who are lost in sin. A God who is still sovereign. May many turn to you so that they may come out of their darkness into your wonderful light. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that we know and love, especially those who do not know and love you. Your hand will be upon them this day. O oh Lord, our God, just speak your word to them. Pray for those who are going through times of trial and tribulation, our fellow believers who are going through trials, and troubles, difficulties in their lives. Those who feel isolated now because they're locked in, so to speak. Bless each one, we pray. We pray for the fellowship here. We thank you for everyone gathered here and those at home who are tuning into the service. And others too who might have stumbled upon this. But oh, most gracious and merciful God, you will speak your word to them. We thank you that we have a gospel to proclaim. And so now we pray in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. I want to look at that uh, particular section we read from John's Gospel, in John chapter 4 this morning. As you know, most of you will know, John wrote his gospel with express purpose. He says in the 20th chapter that there were so many things that he could have included, but he hasn't included. He hasn't got the space. He hasn't got the time. But the things that he has included in his gospel are there for an express purpose. He's placed each one in the sequence of this gospel that's not necessarily chronological in the matter of time, it's not like the synoptics. He places each one in place so that whoever reads it may come to a conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that they might believe in him and have life through his name. It's not often an author will actually give you a complete detail of his motives for writing his book, but John does. And in this particular section that we read this morning, John is giving us one of the seven signs that he includes in this gospel. Jesus did many miracles. There, there are so many, but they're not even in the Bible. But the ones that are included in the Bible are for our instruction. And John has placed them in the Bible, in his book, for our instruction, so that we might come to believe, to strengthen our faith, to bring us to a place where we actually believe who Jesus is and we receive by faith what he has done for us. The first sign was the wedding in Cana when he performed that miracle of changing water into wine. Well, he's been down into Jerusalem, he's been to the Passover, and he's returned to Cana. And John now gives us his second sign. And this is the healing of this man's son. And uh, this man, we, we, we don't know his name, but we're just simply told here uh, that uh, he is an official. Well, the Greek tells us that he's a courtier, a royal official. And he's probably at the court of Herod Antipas, who was tetrarch of that particular area of Galilee. So he's an important man. He's a man with power, a man with authority a man with great influence. 
And when Jesus arrives at Cana, this man travels the 17 to 20 miles from Capernaum, which is on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, down to Cana, where Jesus is. Why? He does so because he is desperate. And this desperation becomes the springboard for faith. And so that John can include this to show us exactly what faith is and how we can put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at a point of death. He travelled that distance to come to Jesus. Why? Well, he was from Capernaum, and Jesus made Capernaum his base for his ministry in Galilee. So Jesus was familiar with Capernaum, and the people of Capernaum were familiar with Jesus. Jesus had gone to the synagogue in Capernaum. He had uh, performed miracles. He had angered so many of the Jews there. And so this man would have known of him. He may have even known him personally. We don't know. We're not told any of these details because John doesn't seem fit to include them here. They're not necessary to what he's saying. But he comes to Jesus. And that's the springboard of his faith. See, faith doesn't operate in abstract. Now, can we just use our imagination for a moment? This isn't in the Bible, but this is taking stuff out of the Bible and just using our imagination to try and get an understanding. Imagine that this man was familiar with Jesus. He would have been a Jew because if he was at the court of Herod Antipas and a courtier there, he would have been a Jew. And as a Jew, he would have gone to the synagogue in Capernaum, which was where Jesus did a lot of teaching and performed miracles. And like many who come into contact with Jesus and his teaching and his power and authority, there may be a kind of complacency to say, well, there's something about this man. There's something quite amazing, but uh, uh, I don't want to know too much because if, if I get too far into knowing about this man or even meeting this man and speaking with this man, it might draw me in uh, into an area where I feel uncomfortable. I might have to make a decision about this man. And if he's a courtier, he might have to make a, uh, an official decision about this man. There are people who today will hear the gospel proclaimed and be attracted by the gospel. And think, wow, well, you know, there's something in this, but uh, maybe another time I'll, I'll further this. I'll, I'll, I'll find out more about this Jesus and maybe even come to a point where I might believe in him. But at the moment, I'll put the barriers up because my life is on an even keel and uh, it may be disruptive to come to know Jesus too much. This man may not be in that category, but many of us have been in that category and many of you are still in that category. What does it take to change the balance? Here, it is desperation. Going along in life, he's got a son, we don't know how old his son is, he's an official, he's a man of responsibility, a man with power, probably quite a wealthy man. Life's fine. And suddenly, his son becomes desperately ill with a fever to the point of dying. Now, suddenly, the whole thing has changed. A crisis has emerged that has shaken the foundation of his security. So that's what happened in the world today. There's mankind going around doing business, technology advancing, wealthy Western societies, self-sufficient, and suddenly a pandemic. And we're all sitting here with masks on, not able to touch each other. Man has been put into a crisis. And this man's crisis was to lead him to faith in Christ that went beyond simply being healed or his son being healed. Desperation brings us into that situation. Think of that woman with the issue of blood. Here she is. She's uh, bleeding and she can't stop bleeding. 
and it's draining her energy, damaging her health and killing her slowly. And in ancient times, she goes to these physicians and spends money. They have very little knowledge, very little understanding. They do their best and uh, it still doesn't help. She spends all her money on it. Every bit of hope is dashed time after time after time after time. Then she hears that Jesus is there. What happens? Jesus is surrounded by a great crowd. How can she get to him? But she's desperate. She can't back away now. She needs to get near to Jesus. And her faith takes her through that crowd, pushing her way very slowly to the point where she can't quite get to him except just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. But she feels, as her faith is strengthened, even though her body is being weakened, if she can just do that, something will happen. And she touches his garment and she's healed immediately. Your faith has healed you, said the Lord Jesus to her. Desperation. The springboard for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, saving faith is just like that. Faith. Coming to Christ so that our whole lives and destiny can be transformed, that we may have an eternal dwelling with God, our sins forgiven, is just like that. We get to a point when we realise our self-sufficiency is useless. We can't make it on our own. And so this follows on into the challenge that Jesus gives to this man who comes to him and begs that his son may be healed. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. It seems a strange thing to say to this man who's just come to him and said, come along, come along, my son is sick to the point of death. Jesus often responds with, with a kind of question that throws us. Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. What's he doing? Oh. John has included signs here in his Bible. In his book, wonders are our response to the signs, the effect of the signs, the effect of the actions. And Jesus is really challenging the man. He wants to firstly challenge his motive. Why are you really coming to me? Are you coming to me just so that you can see something quite wonderful? Now we know that this man's desperation is greater than just simply curiosity on seeing something wonderful because that which is wonderful he wants to happen to his son but he's challenging the man's motive because he lived in a day where signs and wonders and all these things were were a great attraction to particularly to the Jews remember Paul writing there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says but Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. He has to go beyond that superficiality of seeking a religious experience, if you like, if you want to put it that way. Something like that. As a kind of novelty, as a, as something that would bring you a step above uh, the mundane or the ordinary or the physical. And the Jews were constantly doing this. They were constantly looking for signs. Jesus was giving signs, but they weren't <laughs> interpreted by the Jews in the right way. They didn't understand these signs. They rejected them. And the Gentiles wanted these things too. They sought wisdom. They loved debate. They loved a new kind of teaching. Remember Paul on the Mars Hill in Athens? And there he was at the Areopagus with all these philosophers wanting to know something new. Why? Because every day they wanted to know something new. There's something in the human spirit that says, I need to, to have something new. Novelty. And Paul said when he preached the gospel, look, it's a stumbling block to the Jews. You'll trip over these things. They won't bring you closer to God because that's all you're seeking. And to the Greeks, well, it'll be foolishness to you. Because when I preach the true gospel, why Jesus really came, you won't accept that. It's a teaching from heaven. It is God's way. And you will reject God's way because you
because you're seeking him for the wrong reason. And Jesus did this to draw out the man's faith. Remember in the previous sign at Cana in Galilee, when Jesus turned water into wine, when Mary came to him, the wine had run out. There was just uh, water left. And they came to Jesus. Mary came to Jesus. Why? Because she knew Jesus was different. She was his mother. She had been met with the angel before the birth. She, was, she knew exactly uh, what had been happening inside of her womb when Jesus was born. And she knew Jesus. He was the son of God and knew these things. But Jesus had to teach her something too. When she came to him and told him about this uh, lack of wine and all the disaster will come upon the household of the, uh, uh, because uh, you hear was something that, uh, that was humiliating for the people there. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He often addressed her, woman, gunai, which was a mark of respect incidentally. It wasn't uh, said in the way that we might say woman. Do you know my hour has not yet come? Look, there's something greater than all these things I can do for people while I'm here on earth. My hour is the hour when they nail me to the cross. Understand that. And then she says to the people, do whatever he tells you to do. And we have that wonderful miracle, that sign. Remember he did it with the Syrophoenician woman. This, this, uh, this uh, Gentile woman who, who, who came from, a, from a, almost from the lowest caste, if you like. And she comes to Jesus, who is ministering to the Jews. And uh, she begs him. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. For it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Again, you think, how can he talk to someone like this? The woman's come to ask her daughter to be healed. And, and now he's talking to her like this. But Jesus is drawing out the true motive for believing in him. But she answered him, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Ah, that's what Jesus wanted to hear. And he said to her, for your statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Sometimes when we are challenged, we are desperate, and we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we need our motive challenged by him. Why am I coming? Is it just I want something from him? Like a benign uncle? No. He's not going to respond to that kind of faith. He wants to know what's in the heart. What's behind it? Are you ready to submit? Are you ready to cast everything upon him? That's the kind of faith. And here's the true nature of faith in verses 49 to 50. Firstly, this man believes that Christ is able to do these things. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He recognises who Jesus is and he recognises that Jesus is the only one who can do what he pleads for him to do, heal his son. He looks solely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard people ask to give testimonies. Testimonies about their faith. I've heard people being commended for their faith. And if you listen to the radio and you listen to religious services on the radio, uh, people are now addressed as people of faith. Faith itself has no power whatsoever other than the psychological power that it might have. If you put your faith in your doctor or you put your faith in a, a driver or you put your faith in everywhere else. We use faith all the time. But that's not the faith that God is talking about or the faith that Jesus is talking about. Faith has to be centred on Jesus. It's not the faith, it's the grace. Remember Paul says, it's by grace you say through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's the grace that saves, it's the faith that takes it. It's the faith that's the hand, as it were, that reaches out in desperation. It was the faith of the woman who reached through the crowd and touched his garment. Her hand of faith 
withdrew from Jesus the power to heal her. And so the man is exercising that first prerequisite of faith. He comes to Jesus. It's not your faith. We sometimes crumble at the thought that our faith is so weak. But Jesus said, even if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you put it in my hands and see what it will do. It's the power of Jesus, not the faith. The faith takes hold of the power of Jesus. And he desires, above everything else, the presence of Christ. He feels and senses that if Christ can travel those 70 to 20 miles from Cana back up to Capernaum and get to his son in time, that his son will be healed. And something wonderful happens. And I think it's so encouraging for us here today because... Jesus is not with us in the flesh in the same way as he was in Cana in Galilee or in Capernaum. He's in glory. He's at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's our great high priest. And if this man believed that Jesus had to be physically present to heal his son, uh, and his faith stopped there, he would be disappointed. Because Jesus isn't going anywhere. third point here is that he takes God's word. Jesus said to him, yours go, your son will live. Go, your son will live. Jesus says the word. Isn't that wonderful? We can take God at his word. He says it. He speaks to us. He speaks to us this morning from his word. And it's as good as if he's here, present, because he is here, present, through his word, through the Spirit. May not see him, may not feel his presence. We long to feel more and more of his presence, but that's not the point. Faith puts its trust in what he says, that he will do what he says. For isn't he the word made flesh? And so as he says the word, something happens in a town 16 to 20 miles away. He just says, go, your son will live. Now what a challenge that is to this man. I've come all this way. I've travelled down from Capernaum to Cana. And... Uh, I've met with him and he's spoken to me and now he's told me to go home because everything's going to be all right. But I wanted him to come with me. Will you come with me? Remember Moses said to, to, to the Lord, if you don't come with us, we're not going. How we long that Christ is with us all the way. Or we sense his presence all the way. But faith begins by taking that his word. And his word is his presence. And his presence will be with his word. And his word will have the power and authority of his presence. Because he and his word are inseparable. And faith then trusts simply what Jesus says. That's enough. And we know that this man believed. He takes God at his word. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Faith begins by believing his word to us and his word then ushers us into his presence. Remember there was a centurion, a Gentile who came to him and he understood this. He said, just say the word. Say the word. I know if you speak, if you say the word, it will come about. Say the word, Lord, and it will come about. It will happen. Because you said it. Remember many times I said, I used to have an old assistant pastor. And uh, I inherited him with the church. He was 80 years old. He was a wonderful man of God. A great Pentecostal pastor he was. Uh, and he used to tap his Bible and say, God says it. I believe it. That settles it. And that was almost 
Every Sunday he said that to me as I finished preaching. And here we now see the victory of faith in verses 51 to 53. As he was going down, his servants met him because something had happened to this boy. And so they come dashing down. Can you imagine the, the dust coming up from the road from the Capernaum to, to, to Cana, the toing and froing. They met him and told him his son was in covering, recovering. So he asked them the hour and it began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour. They, this, this boy suddenly sat up. He was right. The fever had left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. What a wonderful, wonderful miracle, a sign. And John has placed it here so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing we'll have life in his name. But it doesn't quite end there with the joyous miracle. Because the whole purpose of this was that this man would believe what John had placed in his word. That the purpose of this would be that he came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I believe it's here, right at the very end. And he himself believed. Not that Jesus would heal his son, because his son was now healed. He didn't have to believe that anymore. But now he truly believed who Jesus was. And what was even more wonderful, and all his household. The effect of this was that a whole group of people had come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. No wonder John selects these things and places them so lovingly within his gospel. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? And if you do, you have life in his name. Take him at his word. Read the Bible. Believe what God says to you and put your trust in what God says to you and you will find transformation in your life, in your prayers, and in the midst of your desperation, you will have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Most gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that John included these things within the Bible, that we can read them and marvel at them, but more than that, be instructed by them. We just pray that each one of us who has heard your word we come into that living relationship with you through Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, Thou Lamb of Calvary, Saviour Divine. Faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Saviour divine. Now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, oh, may my love to thee pure, warm, and changeless be, a living fire. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. When ends life's transient dream, 
When death's cold sullen stream shall all be rolled, bless Saviour, then in love, fear and distrust remove. Oh, bear me safe above a ransomed soul. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.